thank you for coming. I really echo uh, Mark's prior comments that it's always a pleasure to speak to the patients and their families and uh, to be able to be in the same room and uh, to speak to you directly is always a great opportunity for all of us. So thanks for the opportunity and thanks for coming out on an evening. Uh, everybody's very busy, so hopefully we can provide you with some news. And uh, Dr. Kerr Nicholas and I will go back and forth during the uh, uh, presentation, so uh, bear with us. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about methods of delivering uh, novel therapies into the liver for METS2 uh, from colon cancer to the liver. Uh, why are we doing this? Uh, it's not really uh, all new, but it's old. Uh, it's like an iPhone. Uh, I should have a picture of an iPhone 7. This is the original iPhone. I think next year will be the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, so uh, I'll have to change the picture for next year. Uh, this really only applies to colorectal cancer, so that's what we're going to address, although we're talking about uh, liver metastases. So although the disease is in the liver, it is colon cancer. There's nothing wrong with the old ways, and we still depend a lot on old ways uh, to treat uh, this cancer. Uh, oral and IV chemotherapies are the sort of the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, in fact, chemotherapy has gotten a lot better in the last 15 years uh, for the treatment of colorectal cancer. I think uh, Dr. Berry, who's in the back, will also uh, uh, agree with me when he says, uh, you know, when we trained, there was really only one drug for uh, treatment of colorectal cancer for chemotherapy. Now we have a number of drugs. Uh, including biologic agents. This is not a complete list, it's a partial list. 5-FU and leucovorin really has been the bread and butter or the, um, or the backbone of all chemotherapies. There have been a number of other drugs that have come on board, oxaliplatin, arantican, combinations of these drugs, including Fulfury, Fulfox, Xelox. These are some terms that you might have heard. Uh, and then the newer therapies, what we call the biologic agents, so bevacizumab or avastin, cetuximab, uh, panitumumab, and then combinations with chemotherapy such as cetuximab and arantican, and then the newer oral agents such as regorafenib, and a drug that uh, never quite made it to market here is aflibercept, which is uh, sort of a newer generation uh, bevacizumab. And there's a, perhaps another drug that will come from Asia into uh, the Western world, uh, that's TAS-102, which is a combination chemotherapy pill. So as you can see, a number of drugs have really come into being. They're all quite uh, now uh, pretty expensive, and uh, there are also costs to the healthcare system for providing these medications. So we have to learn how to best use these, uh, these drugs for patients. So why? Uh, look at new, uh, new ways or old ways. Uh, because the surgery has gotten a lot better, I think Dr. Karen Nicholas will tell you that uh, how surgeons view uh, the liver in terms of what they can cut out uh, has really evolved probably in the last 15 to 20 years. And patients are actually going through what we call more lines of therapy. They go through first-line therapy, second-line therapy, third-line therapy, and now even fourth-line therapy, and some beyond those uh, those lines, and uh, patients can still remain very well despite having advanced cancer uh, that uh, has responded and grown on uh, different types of therapy. And overall, we feel that given the better uh, improvement in surgical techniques and chemotherapy, that more patients are becoming candidates for liver resection, with the goal being that if you can resect the cancer in the liver, that uh, you have better odds of long-term survival, and that's what we would always want for our patients. Uh, although all these therapies are uh, now available, they all have uh, its limits. The newer systemic therapies uh, have uh, limited value. Uh, for example, rigorafenib or Stiverga, which is the oral new agent, uh, doesn't generally lead to reduction in cancers as we can see them when we look at a CAT scan, uh, although those can lead to better um, uh, overall survival uh, despite the cancer not shrinking in the body. Um, how can we address the tumors in the liver if resection is not uh, possible? So if you have colorectal can uh, liver metastases, uh, 
that is not amenable to surgery. Is, are there ways uh, we, where we can get you there with chemotherapy? And chemotherapy can certainly do it, uh, but uh, only a minority of patients can receive chemotherapy and have their tumors in the liver downsized so that somebody like Dr. Karen Nicholas can go in and resect uh, the tumors and leave enough liver for one to survive. Uh, so we've, we thought we would try to introduce this program to Canada, and we did this with the help of uh, the um, with Philomena, of course, and the support of many different people. And this is a program that existed in New, in New York as well as in other parts of the U.S. for probably the better part of 10 to 15 years. And um, this is probably, I think this is a picture of, uh, of Dr. Karen Nicholas doing the first operation here um, and placing the pump in one of our first patients, uh, I believe about three years ago now. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Karen Nicholas to talk a little bit about uh, why we are uh, using this technology, which is old but new to Canada, to help uh, patients with uh, uh, this cancer. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to go in a little bit into the background of why we think it makes sense to put chemotherapy directly into people's liver and into the artery in particular. Um, and then uh, Yuj will, will take over again a little bit at the end. And so this here is a picture of somebody's liver, and it doesn't look a lot like a liver. I don't know if anyone in the room has seen a liver or if you've eaten liver perhaps or... Um, but this doesn't look like a liver, but the reason is because this is an angiogram. So this is just looking at the blood supply to a liver, the arteries specifically that supply a liver. And what you can see is um, this area over here is actually where the tumor is. And uh, you can make out a little bit of a circle over here. Uh, and what you'll notice is this is when contrast is put into somebody's hepatic artery, so their main artery supplying the liver, and it comes over here, and there's all these new little arteries. Oh, you can't see the pointer at all. I'm sorry. I will... Um, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Well, I'm glad you finally said something. How, do, how long were you going to let me keep pointing around? So, so here's, the, uh, here's the liver tumor over here. There's a circle over here. And this is the main hepatic artery that's leading up. And then it gives branches. And one of the things that's, that's interesting about tumors is they tend to um, take vessels. They parasite new blood vessels and new arteries that uh, arise to supply these tumors. Um, and so the fact that they are so well vascularized actually makes it a target. So there's actually now some um, sort of chemotherapy-like drugs that specifically attack the blood supply to tumors. And this also provides an opportunity to treat them by putting drugs directly into the artery. One of the unique things about the liver that all again makes it optimal for this sort of therapy is the fact that it actually has a dual blood supply. So whereas most parts of your body only have an artery supplying them and a vein draining them, the liver actually has an artery and a vein that supplies it and a vein that drains it. And the vein that supplies it is called the portal vein, and it's, that's because it's the portal to the liver, and that's this blue structure over here, and the red structure is the artery. But interestingly, the majority of the normal liver is supplied by the portal vein. So about three quarters of the blood to the normal liver comes from the portal vein, but tumors within the liver, whether they are primary tumors that start in the liver or tumors that have started elsewhere and spread to the liver, are almost exclusively supplied by the artery. So that provides an opportunity, again, to, to treat these tumors by putting drugs directly into the artery because you will preferentially treat the tumor and not the normal liver. The other thing that's unique about the liver compared to other organs in the body is that it acts as a filter to take out toxins. I mean, that's the main job of the liver is to uh, remove toxins that are circulating in the bloodstream. So when certain drugs are given to the liver, the liver itself will basically filter them and very little of, the, of that uh, toxin or drug in this case will make it to the rest of the body. And so this is an old study now. This was published in 1983. You can see over 30 years ago. And it looks at a number of um, sort of old chemotherapy drugs. These are 
chemotherapy drugs that I think would even have been around in Dr. Koh's training generation. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's only one drug, why it took five years of training still. But anyways, but, um, so these are a number of drugs that were tested to see when they're delivered via the hepatic artery, what happens to them, how much of it is absorbed by the liver versus how much goes to the rest of the body. And what you can see is some of these drugs, so they all have some what we call hepatic uptake. So they, they're all more effective than giving them via a vein and circulating everywhere. But one drug in particular, this FUDR, when you give it uh, via the hepatic artery, you essentially get 100 to 400 times greater exposure within the liver than you would get if you gave it via the vein. Okay, so that's the drug that we use when we're delivering this treatment. And again, it's not a new drug, it's an old drug. It's actually been around for, as you can see, over 30 years here. And it's actually a similar version to 5-FU, which is that classic drug that is still used today um, in an IV form to treat pretty much everybody with colorectal cancer. So it's essentially giving the same drug, but when you give it directly via the artery into the liver, you get more than 100 times the exposure to the tumor, which is what you're trying to treat because you don't have to go Go to the rest of the body. So it essentially allows us to give a much higher concentration of the drug to the tumor. So this is the way that we deliver it. Um, it's a pump. It's, uh, this is the manufacturer. Um, and it's about the size of a hockey puck. So it's, uh, it's like a port. Some of you may have seen a port that sits underneath the skin and can be accessed to give intravenous chemotherapy. This, this sits in the same space, so it's underneath the skin, but as you can see, it's substantially larger. So, you know, when we do put one in, people, patients, especially if they're slim, get a little bit of, of a bulge. We tend to put it um, in the abdomen, and it does require an operation to, to put it in. So that's one of the downsides to this therapy, is it, it does require a real operation to insert it. So again, we generally will put it in somewhere in the abdomen, either on the right side or the left side, and it has a long catheter attached to it that we will then tunnel and, and put into an, the main artery that is supplying the liver. It's a fairly simple device, uh, so some people may not like the idea of a, what sound, a pump inside them, but there's no batteries, there's no electrical parts to it, uh, so the pumps really are, very rarely have mechanical problems. There are two chambers within it, one chamber that, that's called the drug chamber, and this is where the drug goes, so either FUDR, as I mentioned to you, or, or other things that we may deliver. And then there's another chamber called the, the charging fluid uh, chamber that is actually freon gas, so the same gas that's in your air conditioner uh, basically goes in here, and it basically gets compressed. So when the drug gets put into the pump, the, this chamber gets compressed and then very slowly over a very reproducible rate, taking about two weeks, this compresses and pushes the chemotherapy out through the catheter. So it delivers about uh, just over one milliliter of uh, fluid a day. So it's a very slow rate. It takes just over two weeks to deliver everything that's within it. And so the pump basically gets accessed the same way that a port would get access, just by putting a needle into it. And um, whatever's in gets drained, and then the new fluid goes in. So either chemotherapy or whatever's being used to treat the patient. And then that gets accessed about every two weeks. So there are a few limitations in terms of what patients can do uh, when they have these pumps in. Usually they're not a huge impact to some patients, although depending on what patient's lifestyle is like, they may be. So the first thing, as you can imagine, is we wouldn't want this getting banged around too much because there's chemotherapy inside. So patients can't uh, participate in contact sports when they have one of these pumps in. It runs based on uh, pressure and temperature and a predictable temperature of the body. So basically, patients can't do anything that changes the, the pressure or the temperature dramatically. So that means no scuba diving, no, um, uh, no flying in non-commercial flights, uh, things like that, and no hot tubs or saunas or hot water bottles on the actual pump itself. And no alcohol while, while uh, patients are being treated with this therapy either. 
This is the surgery that we do to insert it. So we basically make an incision um, and uh, we always remove the gallbladder. And that's because the same artery that supplies the liver also supplies the gallbladder. And we don't want any chemotherapy going to the gallbladder. Otherwise the gallbladder can get sick and need to be removed. Uh, if the primary tumor is still in, so in the colon or rectum, we will remove that at the same operation. Uh, we may or may not biopsy the liver if there's any concerns about the quality of the liver or the tumors within it. We'll put the catheter into the artery um, and uh, we'll inject it with blue dye to confirm that it's going to the liver and more importantly that it's not going anywhere outside of the liver um, because again we don't want to deliver chemotherapy anywhere outside of the liver or people can get quite sick from that. So I've got a couple of graphic pictures. So. Uh, Kind of shield your eyes if you're just eight and are concerned you're going to get nauseated. But this is basically an incision. So most commonly we'll actually just do a, an up and down incision. This was a different patient that was actually having a piece of liver resected at the same time, removed at the same time. So that's why uh, this incision exists. But usually it's an incision that goes up and down to place the, the actual catheter in and then a separate incision where the pump is placed. And this is what the catheter looks like uh, in place. So you can see uh, these are the arteries um, over here. Uh, and these are loops that are just around them uh, to, to isolate them. And this is the catheter going into the artery and tied in place. I'm not sure how well this is projecting, but basically this is after we've injected with blue dye. And, uh, and again, this is, the liver now has turned blue um, and we look and we don't see any blue anywhere else. This is some intestine over here. Um, and so that's the operation that we do to put it in. After surgery, we again want to check to make sure that the pump is in place and flowing to the liver and nowhere outside of the liver. So we actually do another test called a technetium 99 scan where we, we put some nuclear, um, a substance that has a nuclear, tag, nuclear substance tagged to it into the liver, into the pump. And then we do a nuclear scan to see that it flows and there's uptake in the liver and nowhere outside of the liver. And as I mentioned, every two weeks, um, patients come into the cancer center and have it filled. And we alternate between chemotherapy with this FUDR and just with uh, heparinized saline to keep the pump flushing. So it's actually, patients get chemotherapy every four weeks. It's important to note that this is given in combination with regular chemotherapy. So it's not instead of regular IV chemotherapy, uh, we give it in combination. We reduce the dose of intravenous chemotherapy a little bit, um, but we give this in addition to that to try and really get as much effect as we can within the liver and prevent new growth outside of the liver. If there's a time that the pump won't be used, so patients want to travel or something else for anywhere from six to eight weeks, we can put in a thicker fluid called glycerol, and then it only needs to be changed every six to eight weeks. But it is important that there's something in the pump constantly flowing, otherwise it dries up and then will malfunction. And we do need fairly close monitoring of patients who are getting this treatment, so we will measure uh, liver blood tests every two weeks to make sure that we don't see any concerns. So it is a pretty intense uh, treatment, um, and there are certainly complications that can happen with it. So basically, some sort of a complication related to the pump happens in one out of every five patients. So complications are actually pretty common. They may be um, anything from infection at the pump site to um, a flow of, of uh, chemotherapy to outside of the liver, um, uh, the pump itself can flip over, so lots of things can happen. About half the time that can be salvaged or fixed, either with antibiotics or with a minor procedure. But unfortunately what that means is about half the time, so one out of every 10 patients, we actually have to stop the chemotherapy and not use the pump anymore. So in terms of the effectiveness um, and does it work, um, there is quite a bit of data on this. So as Dr. Koh mentioned, this is not a new treatment. It's been around uh, for 20, 30 years, really. Um, so there's quite a lot of studies that have looked at them. Um, most of the studies and most of the data is from a time, um, as you heard, back when we only had really one chemotherapy drug. So what we don't have is a lot of studies comparing it to modern day chemotherapy to let us know which one is better. Also, the other limitation is at the time, 
um, this treatment was being given in isolation, so just pump chemotherapy alone. And now we know that pump chemotherapy in combination with regular intravenous chemotherapy actually works better. So although we have a lot of data, data and we know that this therapy produces very good responses in the liver, meaning it makes the tumors shrink down much better than regular intravenous chemotherapy, we don't have as much data as we would like um, to tell us you know, how that translates into what's actually important to patients because you know, we care about making the tumors on scans smaller, but ultimately what we care most about is having patients feel good as, the, as good as they can for as long as they can, and ideally getting patients to the point that we can do an operation and remove all the tumors and ultimately get to a cure is, is most of our goal. Um, and so those are really the goals, our long-term disease control within the liver, and if possible, shrinking tumors down to the point that we can do a resection and remove all of the disease from within the liver. Um, or in rare situations, allowing for what's called a complete response, meaning the cancer is completely gone from the liver uh, and stays away. So that's really the, the goal and the dream. And, um, and as I said, what we know is that when, it, when patients are treated with this treatment alone, then the response rate that we see in the tumor, so the tumor shrinkage, is about similar to what we see with the new combination drugs when, when they're used. When we use the pump chemotherapy combined with systemic chemotherapy, then um, we actually see much better response rates, resection rates, longer responses, and higher survival compared to what we can achieve with regular intravenous chemotherapy. Although again, this, is, this says phase two data, phase three data. What that basically means is phase two data is just less uh, certain. It's not as much evidence and not as strong evidence. So it seems to be the case, but it's not as certain as the data that we had um, in the past. So what we did then, thanks to the uh, Colorectal uh, Cancer Association of Canada's help, is we put together a consensus uh, group, uh, was like three years, three or four years ago, 2010, no, 2012, no, must have been 12. 2012. So four years ago, we actually uh, put together a group. So we had um, uh, surgeons, medical oncologists, uh, patients um, uh, from Canada and the U.S. come together to Toronto uh, and discuss this treatment and where we felt it, it should lie, where its place was in the modern era. And these are the consensus statements that this group came up with. So the first is we felt that when this chemotherapy was being given, it should be in combination with regular intravenous chemotherapy, uh, that it should be offered in the context of a multidisciplinary program because it is quite complex to deliver, and that pump chemotherapy in combination with systemic intravenous chemotherapy should be considered in patients with unresectable, meaning we can't do an operation to remove all of the tumors, liver metastases, who have progressed on first-line treatment, meaning that the first-line treatment is no longer working, and then it's acceptable as first-line treatment as well. Uh, so basically that tries to put it in context and where it goes with the modern-day chemotherapy, and we've refined that a little bit over the past couple of years since we've been doing this to the point that all patients that we're considering this in, we will treat with some intravenous chemotherapy first to make sure that the disease isn't progressing on chemotherapy. But we tend not to treat to the point that the chemotherapy is not working anymore because what, what we need to do is we need to stop the chemotherapy before going to the operating room to put this pump in. And if the cancer is progressing already at that time, we find that by the time we go to the operating room and stop chemotherapy, that oftentimes it's too late. So we tend now to use it after just a little bit of first-line chemotherapy to what we would call best response. So when it just seems that the response is sort of plateauing to that first-line chemotherapy. We don't use this chemotherapy anytime there's any cancer outside of the liver. So that's the main criteria for us is that it's colorectal cancer that has spread to the liver, can't be removed from the liver with an operation, and has not spread anywhere other than the liver. So that's the kind of the main criteria for who we would consider this therapy in. And in addition, um, this number five uh, refers to patients who have had an operation to remove this cancer from their liver. And there is a role in addition to putting this pump in and treating with chemotherapy directly to the liver to try and prevent the cancer coming back again. 
So that's called adjuvant therapy. We tend, we not tend, we don't currently do that uh, at Sunnybrook, but it is an area that we're interested in and may uh, move to that in the future. So just to summarize uh, this part again, hepatic artery infusion pump chemotherapy in combination with systemic therapy may be a part of an expanding armamentarium. So as you've heard hopefully a few times tonight, we've got a number of evolving treatments and HAI we think fits into that nicely for selected patients. It's definitely not for everyone, but as I said, it's really for those patients where the cancer is spread to the liver, nowhere else, and it can't be removed. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it back over to Dr. Ko to give you a little bit of an update on, on our program. So when we started this a uh, number of years ago, it started as a pilot program and we uh, had a goal of treating about 10 patients. And it was really su uh, supported by a grant from the Canadian Cancer Society. And it was, we did not feel that it was considered to be experimental uh, and that we were just uh, interested in whether it could be, uh, it was feasible to do it in Canada with our resources. It's now a supported program, but it is a clinical trial. And I'll explain why it's a clinical trial. And the eligibility, uh, I'll expand on what Dr. Kiernickler said, is that uh, we right now, because of the surgery, the age is capped at less than 75, what we call a good performance status. So the patient has to be quite well, being able to take care of themselves and have very few symptoms from the cancer. They have to be medically fit to undergo a major operation. Again, the cancer has to be in the liver only and it's not amenable to a liver operation that uh, it has been treated with uh, uh, some sort of chemotherapy and has not spread beyond the liver. Uh, the tumor that where it started, the primary tumor, either colon or rectum, can be in place. And uh, everybody is actually born with a slightly different uh, blood supply to the liver. And uh, there's uh, quite a variation that's natural, and, but not all of it is suitable for this type of therapy. And you do have to have uh, suitable um, uh, anatomy. So uh, based on this, uh, it's, it is a formally a clinical trial in Canada. The reason why it's a clinical trial is because the drug that we put in called FUDR is old. It is probably 30 years old. Uh, it was available in Canada many years ago, but it was never approved by Health Canada. So the drug never got approved for any indication, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, or lung cancer. So there is no label for it in Canada. It did get approved in the United States. And for a drug that's not, um, for a pharmaceutical drug that's not approved in Canada, there are only two ways that one can bring it into Canada to treat Canadian patients. And one's on an individual patient basis, uh, such as it's called a special access program. So an example of that would be uh, if you have some rare infection that you caught uh, while traveling somewhere in the world, and there is treatment, but the drug's not approved in Canada, and you came back sick, uh, your doctor could petition Health Canada to allow you to be treated with drug that's imported specifically just for you. So that's one way. The other way is uh, through a clinical trial. So a clinical trial will allow the sponsor, which is us, to import the drug from uh, a place such as the U.S., and to be given to uh, patients who are tr treated within the context of a, a very specific program. And so we did, uh, we initially treated the first three patients through the special access program, but after discussion with Health Canada, uh, it was felt that we needed to make it into a clinical trial to provide sort of broad access to the drug. The drug is not expensive. It is probably about $120. But because this is a niche program, and uh, niche meaning that only a small number of patients are really suitable for the, uh, uh, this program, uh, you can imagine that the, uh, the drug costs $130 and there may be 20 patients a year who get treated on this program that there's not a large market for this. Uh, so that's why it will remain a clinical trial in Canada because there's no, otherwise no other way of gaining access. It is important to know that the pump itself, the hardware, was approved by Health Canada for this indication. But the company that makes the pump does not make the drug. 
And so they're, they are approved independently uh, in the U.S., also in Canada, by different bodies of uh, the a regulatory agency, which is the government. So the pump is approved, but the ingredient that goes in the pump was never approved. Uh, so that's sort of like the left hand not doing and for those of us who are married, sometimes you know that the hus your husband, your spouse doesn't exactly do what you expect them to do. <laughs> for example, I think my wife didn't know that I had to give this talk, so uh, she was out this evening. <laughs> anyway, so the logistics, uh, Dr. Kerr Nicholas has gone into, the pump is filled every two weeks. There, uh, it does require some nursing expertise to be able to access the pump properly. Uh, we generally give the first treatment two weeks after the surgery into the pump, and then we alternate between the chemotherapy and the heparin. And again, it is not in place of regular chemotherapy. It is in addition to regular chemotherapy. So uh, the regular chemotherapy that patients are on before is continued with a slight modification, reduction in some of the drugs, but it's given uh, really at the same time as the pump chemotherapy. If the patient happens to be from London, Ontario, they will come here every two weeks. We'll treat them with the pump chemotherapy here, but they will get their IV chemotherapy at their home institution, uh, like at the London Cancer uh, Center. Uh, the lab blood tests need to be drawn every uh, two weeks. So. In terms of the update, I think uh, we currently have 10 patients who are actively uh, being treated. Uh, for about every five patients that are referred for ass assessment to our program, we find that maybe about one patient is appropriate. So we do have to screen a number of different uh, patients uh, to find the appropriate patient. And by appropriate mean meaning that we really uh, want to offer the therapy to as many people as possible, but we don't want to uh, because it's, uh, you have to undergo a major operation, stop the chemotherapy, and uh, there are risks involved, obviously. We don't want to uh, suggest this therapy if we don't feel that it's gonna, there's a strong likelihood that it's going to help you. Uh, because it is a big investment for the patient and their families. Uh, so that's why for every five patients that we assess, probably one patient is appropriate. We're not trying to withhold the therapy, it's just that we don't want to uh, expose patients to any additional risks, uh, given how serious the disease is and what, uh, what patients are going through. So uh, the pace we're going now, we are putting in probably about one, uh, treating one patient with an operation probably once per month right now. Uh, it's quickly getting very busy and uh, with the support of the hospital and, uh, and the government, uh, we are permitted to treat a number of these patients. And I think what we didn't mention is before we opened, uh, a number of patients were actually traveling to New York. So uh, they were traveling to New York to have the operation and then traveling there once a month indefinitely to get their treatment. So uh, this has been a huge opportunity for us to sort of bring back the Canadian patients uh, uh, to facilitate it, uh, facilitate their care uh, at a place, even though it's in Toronto. Not everybody in Ontario lives in Toronto. <laughs> So I think the screen just disappeared, but instead of waiting for it to reboot, I'm going to mention one uh, really uh, other technique. So we're talking about liver-directed therapy. So if we can't give chemotherapy directly into the liver, is there anything else we can do? There is something called chemoembolization, where we uh, put a catheter into a blood vessel in the groin and deliver chemotherapy into uh, the blood vessel in the liver but it's actually done through what is called an IR or interventional radiology procedure. So it's an overnight procedure where patients get uh, uh, admitted. It's much like having a cardiac catheterization, uh, so it's not a major operation. And what the point of that is, uh, is, is we take these little micro beads that can be either made of resin or glass, and it's tagged to chemotherapy. And the rationale is we can shower the tumors with these beads that, are, um, that deliver the chemotherapy over a sustained period of time. Uh, so there is, this is an approved therapy in Canada. We're one of the few centers that do something called Dibiri or drug-eluting beads with a chemotherapy. Uh, that's called the Iranotecan. So 
this can be done on, a, um, on select patients who are not eligible uh, to have this pump therapy. So uh, that's one uh, procedure called Debiri that's available here. You may have heard about something called surspheres or Therospheres. Um, and that's a, a similar technique of delivering these beads to uh, the tumors in the liver, but instead of drug delivering chemotherapy, it's attached to uh, a, a source of radiation. So uh, the goal is to deliver um, beads to the liver or the tumors in the liver with uh, little beads that have a, a radiation that will deliver radiation to that. So that's, that is available to a number of uh, sites in Canada, uh, including in London and I believe um, in Montreal. Uh, it is being done as part of a clinical trial at uh, UHN in Mount Sinai. We don't have that here. It's not clear whether radiation uh, beads to the liver versus chemotherapy beads to the liver is better, one, if one's better than the other. But uh, both are available at uh, select centers in Ontario, and it may be more appropriate for patients who cannot undergo a large operation to have a pump in. So it's uh, the number... the profile the patient that's eligible for one treatment versus another is a little bit different. Uh, you can certainly find more information about both these therapies online. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about it on the internet. I think uh, CCAC is an excellent resource. Uh, in fact, I believe that Philomena knows more than I do at this point. So she's an excellent resource for all of this. So there are a number of things that we can do to treat uh, tumors that have spread to the liver that can't be cut out. Uh, this is not, all of these therapies that we talk about is not right for everyone, uh, but uh, there may be a patients who don't know about it, and, uh, and I think patient advocacy groups such as CCAC have been very good at trying to inform uh, patients and their families uh, to inquire about treatments like this. And uh, I think uh, sometimes the patient advocacy uh, groups as well as patients are more informed than the doctors or the healthcare teams themselves. So sometimes when you bring it up with your oncologist, they might not be quite as aware of it. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not aware of other therapies, but they may not be aware that we or other centers are doing therapies like this. But it's always good to have a dialogue with, uh, with the team that's uh, treating you um, to make sure that all available treatment options that are reasonable uh, are provided to you. I think I'll just stop there because I think we're running over time.